in their trade relationship with Beijing. Now, even though Australia had witnessed this kind of doubt and anxiety before about US staying power in Asia, most notably with the enunciation of President Richard Nixon's Guam Doctrine of July 1969. Remember that with things going so badly for the Americans in Vietnam, Nixon was asking US allies in Asia to stand more on their own two feet in terms of providing for their own self-defense. Uh, and he was basically saying the Americans would not get involved in another land war in Asia. Even though we had that experience, uh, Trump nevertheless rattled Australian geopolitical faiths in a different way. He appeared to be impulsive, erratic, difficult to predict. He had no real knowledge of Australia, seemingly no appreciation for the history of the alliance relationship. His style upon entering the White House as president gave form to such concerns. It was quite chaotic and chronically ad hoc, and with some exceptions it continues to be. Now all of these concerns that Australia had seemed to come to fruition in that first, now infamous phone call between Trump and Turnbull early last year. And many of these anxieties about what Trump might mean for the US-Australia relationship came to the fore in the public reaction here to that abrupt exchange between the two leaders. I think the response here was in some ways curious. Uh, in my view, never has so much been made of so little. After all, Alliance true believers, or what I call the Alliance sentimentalists, had spent the last two decades talking about a relationship, to use their expression, quote, that is stronger than it has ever been. And yet some terse words from the US Commander-in-Chief witnessed a strange outpouring of hysterical alarm and feverish panic. How on earth could a US President talk to a close American ally like Trump did to Malcolm Turner? Of course, it needs to be remembered that Trump had been elected on a platform of getting tough on immigration and asking allies to do more for the United States. Yet here was Prime Minister Turnbull in an introductory call with a new president asking him to honour an Obama-era deal that would see the United States take some of Australia's refugees from Manus Island and Nauru. Now, in the screams from the press and some commentators about this treatment was revealed, I think, some of the brittleness in Australia's alliance sensitivities, not to mention the kind of collective amnesia that seems to have engulfed the history of the alliance relationship with the United States. Now, you might remember some of this reaction. There was a lot of talk about crisis about shocks. Uh, some analysts even started to say that Australia had to think about a plan B for life without America. That America was withdrawing from the world, withdrawing from Asia. Australia would be alone. Uh, I think it revealed just how easily forgotten uh, are the far more serious moments of divergence that the country has had with the United States. How easily is it forgotten that so irritable did Gough Whitlam become to Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger that in 1974, the White House considered cutting off our intelligence feed, terminating military exercises with Australia, and crucially, looking at options for relocating its intelligence installations at Pine Gap and Northwest Cape elsewhere. Now, had the Americans followed through on these steps, the alliance would have been left as little more than a brittle chrysalis. But back to Trump. The Australian government steadied the alliance ship uh, last year, quite literally, uh, in May. They did it aboard a floating museum, no less, in New York, aboard the USS Intrepid. Even though, as I understand it, again on very good authority, that in their private meeting aboard the ship, Turnbull and Trump spoke about nothing else other than the business friends that they had in common and their respective social media strategies. Apparently this was all Trump wanted to talk about. And yet I think the Australian response to Trump the kind of Australia and how Australia is going to deal with Trump took a more concrete form on this occasion. That is, shower the President in sentiment and in so doing give him a lesson about alliances, showing what they've been able to do when threatened with an existential crisis. Now, from all reports, it seemed to work by showing Trump images of Australian and American military solidarity over such a long period. It did the trick, I think, of uh, conveying to Trump uh, the depth and the range and the solidity of this relationship 
over the last century. Now, I think it could be that there is a plausible argument actually that Australia, along with Japan, is probably writing the guidebook on how allies should approach the Trump administration. Deal with him one step at a time. Approach him pragmatically, right, with pragmatic national interests in mind. I suspect that the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has his nose just in front in this regard. After all, it was Abe who sped to New York immediately after Trump's election and against protocol uh, sought a meeting with, him, with the President-elect. And uh, it's Abe who's been able to really drive the agenda uh, in getting the Americans interested and engaged again on this idea of a quadrilateral security dialogue with Australia, the United States, Japan and India. Uh, but nevertheless, this combination of, uh, of sentiment and taking, one, one, taking Trump one step at a time seems to be uh, keeping the alliance ship, as I said, very steady. But I do have a question uh, about this use of sentiment and about the way in which the use of sentiment is seen now to outweigh a critical analysis of where America is going under this president. In other words, I think we are overdoing the sentiment. And I want to speak a little bit about that now and then I'll move on to discussing uh, where I think Trump might be going. In terms of America's self-confidence, its belief in itself, its exceptionalist tradition about America being special. Okay. What, it has to be asked, has Australia really gained from talking about 100 years of mateship, which was the slogan that was used in Washington last weekend. It was also the slogan used aboard the Intrepid last year. In Washington on Saturday, the Prime Minister heralded 100 more years of mateship. And he may, of course, be right. In an ideal world, let's hope he is right. Uh, that is, that the United States can maintain its position uh, in Asia over the next century. But I wonder how wise it is to talk this language at a time when American policy is in a state of such flux and when the need is so pressing for Australia, sometimes within but also sometimes without the American alliance, has to chart its own course in a region that is changing so rapidly. In other, in other words, we seem to be talking the language of absolute loyalty when our diplomacy could perhaps be a little bit more subtle, nimble and agile. And uh, for the perfect example of that, you need to look no further than when Malcolm Turnbull said we were joined at the hip of the United States on North Korea. What freedom of manoeuvre does that give Australian policy when the circumstances of any kind of conflict we don't know about, where there might be shades of grey, if there was an absolute clear-cut case of North Korean military aggression against the United States, I have no doubt that either political party in Australia would invoke the ANZUS Treaty. But I think the Prime Minister was too absolute and thus constrained future policy. The problem, as I said, is that the outpouring of sentiment is overwhelming the analytical necessity to understand a change in America. To date, Australian Prime Ministers and Foreign Ministers are talking about the United States they grew up with, the America of Kennedy, Reagan and Clinton, the America that sees itself as the indispensable nation. They're not talking about the United States that is being buffeted by strong protectionist headwinds and not the United States that is suffering from a crisis of self-confidence. This President Trump, as I'll go on to show, does not talk the language of Pax Americana. He doesn't talk the language of American global leadership, of exporting democracy and American values to the rest of the world. In fact, he does quite the opposite, and I think he's one of the main reasons he was elected. Um, 100 years of mateship, I think, is the crudest kind of historical slogan for the Australian-American relationship. But it is entirely in keeping with the way in which, since late last century, the alliance has been fused with the Anzac legend, thus placing it atop a pedestal and virtually beyond criticism. This slogan paints a picture of unending military partnership across the 20th century and into this one. And I just say, the caveats and the nuance of this is very important. There is absolutely no question that allies should commemorate shared military sacrifice and their struggles in defence of the values that both countries hold dear. What I'm saying is it's a problem when the misty eyes start to uh, glaze over the need for clear, 
headed analysis. The problem with this slogan is that it reduces the relationship to a caricature. So, let me just ask a series of questions. Was it the act of a mate when Woodrow Wilson in May 1917 proposed a requisition of merchant ships that Australia had paid for from America, which were to carry Australian exports of wheat and flour to Britain and its allies? Right, this was a move which the Prime Minister at the time, Billy Hughes, with all the truculence and arrogance that Hughes could muster, Hughes called it an unfriendly act. And when Hughes was planning to go back uh, to Australia via America after the Paris Peace Conference, Woodrow Wilson sought advice as to whether or not he was able to prevent Hughes being granted a visa to enter the United States. That was the level of acrimony between the two men. Was it the act of a mate when Douglas MacArthur told the British envoy in Tokyo in mid-1948 that Australians were, quote, chauvinistic and short-sighted, a people who, quote, tucked away as they were in one corner of the Pacific, did not appreciate world values? Was it the act of a mate when John F. Kennedy told Australian Foreign Affairs Minister Garfield Barwick in, in October 1963 that the United States would only offer the barest of logistical assistance if Australian troops came into conflict with the Indonesians in the jungles of Borneo during the confrontation crisis with Malaysia? Was it the act of a mate when Lyndon Johnson did not consult John Gordon about a bombing halt in North Vietnam in 1968, causing Gordon to fume privately to a senior Australian journalist? He said, quote, this was no way to treat an ally. Would Billy McMahon have called Nixon a mate after the American president left him stranded politically at home by announcing that Nixon was going to China, even though for nearly two decades Australia had been at pains to coordinate its China policy with that of Washington? Was Nixon's refusal to extend an invitation to Gough Whitlam to visit the White House for nearly five months in 1973? And that was on account of Whitlam's criticism of the December 1972 bombings on Hanover and Haiphong. Was that the act of a good mate? Would Bob Hawke have seen US trade policy that so hurt Australian farmers in the 1980s as the act of a mate? Finally, did Alexander Downer and John Howard see President Clinton's refusal to provide US ground troops for the East Timor operation in 1999 as an act of mateship? Now again, granted, the United States did provide crucial diplomatic muscle at that time, pressure on the Indonesian President Habibi. They provided crucial intelligence and logistical uh, assistance and over-the-horizon presence that were absolutely critical to the success of that East Timor mission. But the point I'm making is this. Downer and Howard had an insurance premium view of the alliance, which Howard told Clinton, Clinton he told Clinton, the Australian people would find it very difficult to understand that Australia, having been there alongside you in all those wars since the beginning of the 20th century, and you're now going to refuse to provide us with Marines. Right? There was a sense of expectation that because Australia had paid its alliance dues, it was going to receive American military assistance on the ground. Okay, now I don't, just to be sure, I don't recite these episode, episodes to construct a kind of a black armband view of the Australian-American alliance, if I can put it that way, a kind of a, a litany of grievance, and isn't this terrible how we've been treated so wickedly by this great power ally? No, I mean, I am not constructing some kind of anthem of anti-Americanism here. It's absolutely nothing of the sort. It is simply a very, very basic point about national interests, and that there have been times in this past 100 years where quite understandably and quite properly America has acted in its own national interest. And that has sometimes conflicted with Australia and the two countries have diverged. And the more serious people that I talk to in Washington say an alliance is stronger for these differences and divergences. And we have to be prepared to say no to each other sometimes. Okay, I think this is inherent to alliances. I think you will find and you will find the same kind of history of these kinds of episodes in America's relations with Japan, uh, with Britain, and with other close allies. So, this I think is the problem with this hackneyed and jingoistic recital of 100 years of mateship. Of course I will concede that it rings nicely in American ears, and it might fit nicely on the little badges that the Australian ambassador in Washington has apparently made for the various events marking this year's centenary. 
But I'm asking again, what does Australia gain? What, it might be asked, did Australia really gain from its commitment to the American cause in Vietnam? All the major decisions about American withdrawal and the peace terms with the enemy were made without consulting Australia. Similarly, it might be asked, what did Australia gain from its commitment to the US invasion of Iraq in 2003? Now, of course, some would say a free trade agreement. Fair enough. But the point to be made is that Canada and New Zealand did not join the invasion, and they did not suffer any great blowback from Washington, or at least nothing that was not easily bearable. What I'm leading to here is how do we understand the role of an ally? Right. Do we advocate caution, wise counsel and prudence, or do we assist the Americans at times like Vietnam and Iraq in compounding the strategic folly? That's the question I'm asking. Okay, now enough of major. The more important task, as I've said, I think, is to try and come to terms with what a changing America means. Since Donald Trump's election to the presidency, I think... Uh, Aside from all the buffoonery and the crudity and the tweets uh, and, and all of the other, all of the other, um, all of the other less than uh, impressive <coughs> aspects of his demeanour uh, and his inability, seemingly, with a few very rare exceptions, of being able to develop kind of a presidential gravitas, a, a standing that is commensurate with the dignity of the office. Beyond all of this. Perhaps the most common critique of his foreign policy is that it undermines the liberal international order which has been the basis for prosperity and stability across much of the Western world for the last 70 years. As I said, whether it be scepticism towards the US alliance system in Europe and Asia, his withdrawal from the Paris Climate Change Accords, TPP, or his attacks on the United Nations and other multilateral institutions. President Trump is perceived by many as posing a direct threat to the system of global governance established by the United States in the wake of the Second World War. Now, I think that criticism of Trump conceals a deeper, more serious charge that by undermining the liberal international order is actually diluting the legitimating power of the American idea itself. That is, what I'm talking about here is the core set of beliefs about the United States self-image and its role in the world. Right? The worst charge, of course, is that he is hastening the relative decline of the United States. <coughs> now Trump, as I said earlier, doesn't use this language of Pax Americana. His inaugural address would, would have been the first inaugural address, I think, probably since, uh, probably since, um, would have to be maybe since the 1920s and 30s, where this idea of America having a special province and a divine mission to redeem the world was not in any way given expression or articulated. And that has only added to this prevailing sense of unease, I think, amongst many in America and overseas. Remember, in the acceptance speech that he gave when he won the Republican nomination, he said quite clearly, he said, quote, Americanism not globalism, will be our credo. And the very fact that he attacks regularly the institutions and traditions of American democracy in itself challenges the very idea that the United States is a model for other societies to follow. Now this perception that something is sorely amiss at the heart of the American national psychology, right, that the United States, to use one commentator's expression, has lost faith in its own superiority, has, of course, as you can imagine, prompted an outpouring of attempts to diagnose and remedy this kind of malaise. The distinguished historian David McCulloch, for example, introduced a recent collection of his speeches by expressing the hope, he said, I hope this will remind my fellow citizens, he said, in this time of uncertainty and contention, of just who we are and what we stand for. Now, it's not often you hear a distinguished American virtually admit to the fact that there is a real question mark over what America stands for. Uh, some of the most esteemed foreign policy thinkers uh, in the country uh, are signing up to this kind of view. Uh, Farid Zakaria.
Shikari, for example, says, quote, the great global story of our age is the decline of American influence, the decline of its desire and capacity to use its power to shape the world. Now, as I'll go on to conclude later, I think some of this is frankly hyperbole and overdone and underplays America's strengths and perhaps talks up uh, too much the strengths of its uh, rival China. But the other point, I think, is this. It, it's almost as if American history only started in November 2016 when Trump was elected. Too often, this state of affairs is sheeted home entirely to the coming of Donald Trump to Washington. Uh, never mind the grave damage already done to the so-called liberal international order, uh, and this phrase is fascinating, actually. Uh, a study of, um, or a survey of global newspapers reveals that the phrase liberal international order has really only been used with such frequency and intensity since about 2014, when the Russians went into Crimea and when the Chinese started their uh, program of land reclamation and militarising uh, uh, parts of the South China Sea. So that in itself is fascinating. The way in which that phrase has returned as a symbol of everything that's under threat, my would be it's a symbol of everything that is related to the idea of America and what America has built in the post-war period. But, you know, the Harvard scholar, uh, Joseph Nye, who's written a lot about American soft power, he said late last year, let's not forget that even when American power was greatest, Washington could not prevent the loss of China, the partition of Germany and Berlin, a draw in Korea, Soviet suppression of insurrections within its own bloc, the creation and survival of a communist regime in Cuba, and failure in Vietnam. Now, I'm not sort of wrapping these off to beat up on America. I'm just making a simple point uh, about the way in which this phrase Talking the language of solidarity 
and shared sacrifice, as he did on his trip through Asia last year. This is language they could only have dreamed about when Trump was running as a candidate. Where China was once the economic bogeyman that was raping America, Trump hails his relationship with Xi Jinping, at the same time as labelling the country a revisionist power, as we'll see. Let's analyse um, later on this year the effects of the so-called trade war on China. On North Korea, Trump's sporadic bellicosity often cools to calls for collective action in meeting the threat posed by Pyongyang. And at home, the system of checks and balances in the US political system have largely worked in pushing back against some of the administration's more contentious policies. Still, that might be giving more coherence to what is in effect still, I think, uh, Trump being a work in progress. But nevertheless, I think it's worth bearing in mind that there hasn't been this kind of cataclysmic series of policies uh, that have been put in place, which some might have feared from his um, run for the office. We cannot ignore that the domestic grievances, the anger and the rage and the bitterness in middle America, which brought Trump to power, do seem to uh, portend a longer term shift in how America views and performs in the world. I think it's likely too that Trump will be followed by another populist figure from either the left or the right, either in three years or in eight. I mean, all the hair pulling and hand wringing, uh, quite understandably, about America's pull out from the TPP, uh, often neglects to mention the fact that Hillary Clinton quietly abandoned free trade in the TPP when she ran as the Democratic candidate. I am convinced that Bernie Sanders would have followed the same path. Elizabeth Warren was not a big fan of the TPP. Uh, so I think some of these, uh, these currents that are coursing through American politics are on both sides of the political aisle. So these forces, in particular those that express antagonism towards globalisation, alienation from and antipathy towards Congress, not to mention the deep resentment at the blood and treasure expended on efforts to transform Iraq and Afghanistan into democratic havens in the Middle East, all of these in many ways have tarnished that tradition of exceptionalism, American exceptionalism, which embodies a more ambitious American global posture. That's what Trump ran against. He ran against this whole notion that the United States should be out there trying to rebuild societies and make them into democracies. He ran against the notion of the US being the indispensable nation because he wants to rebuild America at home. So, the Trump presidency has given rise to yet another wave of gloomy prognostications about American decline. As some have argued, Trump is taking a sledgehammer to the international order and thus he's giving the future to the very same aggressive powers, especially the authoritarian regimes of China and Russia, that he purports to protect Americans from. The comparison so often made between the chaos and dysfunction of Trump's White House and the tightening power grip of Chinese President Xi Jinping is taken often as almost irrefutable proof that China will soon remove the United States from its hegemonic perch. Uh, I think, um, you know, the fact that uh, we have a president now in the United States who is not given, as I've said, to this proselytizing about the American mission is quite significant. This is not often discussed in the public commentary, but it is one of the distinguishing features, I think, uh, of the Trump administration, this uh, uh, eschewing, at least at uh, the presidential level. I have no doubt that some below him, including his national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, the defence secretary, uh, Jim Mattis, uh, the secretary of state, and others, are still very much in the mould of wanting the United States to to have this enlarged and ambitious role around the world, but certainly Trump is putting some distance uh, from that. For all Trump's clarion calls about American great greatness, it is likely, I think, that the United States is going to have to accept more and more the disconnect between the allure of its national mythology and the limits of its capacity to affect transformational change abroad. This period, 
then may well come to be seen as the first step, whether Trump is doing it unwittingly or not. It may be the first step in preparing the Americans for the end of global hegemony. The commentator Walter Russell Mead, writing in the Wall Street Journal about six weeks ago, said, quote, Trump's coming may not be as ill-suited to the country's needs as his most fervent detractors believe, because, Russell Mead argued, he's bringing to the fore the harsh reality that the country's post-Cold War national security strategy has run out of gas. Seen in this light, Trump is the president America had to have a leader immune to the siren song of grandiose globalism and a commander-in-chief who appears to grasp that the United States can no longer succumb to the dangers of hubris. But I do think a quick reality check is needed here. I don't think we're about to see America become what they call a normal nation. It will not lose that sense of special mission simply because that part of its national creed runs so deep, and because those who are in the foreign policy establishment at the moment are creatures of their culture, right? The America that, that shaped them was the America that could do anything, right? So the Washington elite will not lose easily the taste of being a superpower. They will cling tightly to the vision and vigour inherent in that description of the United States as the indispensable nation. The problem is this disconnect between what the foreign policy establishment thinks and what middle America thinks. Because middle America has lost faith in America's global mission. And after all, it's middle and working class America who have borne the brunt, the heaviest brunt of military sacrifice uh, in these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And there are some fascinating studies that are being done that in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania had uh, the Democrats, I mean Hillary Clinton, <coughs> You know, didn't visit those states a great deal. Pennsylvania, yes, but not Michigan and Wisconsin. But one of the things that, uh, by all reports, turned voters away, especially Democratic voters, in those states, was the fact that Clinton kept talking about a continual war. Right? Clinton, in many ways, is so much more hawkish and much more interventionist than Trump. It would have been very interesting to see how her first year went. But I think it would have still resulted in some uncomfortable uh, moments for Australia. Um, so what we might be, if it's not going to become a, a normal nation, I was very interested uh, when I visited Washington, New York late last year to help have talks with um, journalists and uh, people in think tanks and some people in uh, government about this whole question of American purpose and what Trump was doing to this idea of American uh, exceptionalism, uh, that the chief correspondent, Washington Bureau Chief of the Financial Term of Financial Times, Ed Luce, who I think is one of the most perceptive analysts of the United States, said that we might be in the beginning of a long period of what he called, quote, exceptional normalisation. Now, if he's right, then the ungluing of that core national belief is going to be a very painful process. Um, because even though there are some, quite legitimately I think, arguing for American renewal, uh, they also find it very hard to contemplate decline, since as the historian Neville Meany argued some time ago, to contemplate de decline, to accept such a future, would mean a rejection of all that lies at the heart of their national identity. And Neville Meany wrote at the end of the Cold War, he said, the question here is what happens when a national mythology loses its virtue? And I think that question is as relevant today as it was at the end of the Cold War, when there again was this incredible introspection in the United States about what its world role would be, now that the communist enemy had collapsed. China's rise, however, presents the idea of American exceptionalism with an altogether different challenge. It is difficult to see an American president or national security advisor developing a strategy to accommodate Chinese power, even though it is more and more apparent that, that, that perhaps the United States may have to grudgingly do so. Still, at the same time, predictions are dangerous. It's worth recalling that the scholars and commentators who in the 1970s, in the wake of Vietnam and Watergate, were predicting US decline 
then witnessed the rebirth of American purpose under Reagan and the subsequent collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, I'm by no means saying that communist China is about to collapse, but it could face substantial demographic, environmental and social challenges in the years ahead, challenges that may well work to America's long-term advantage. As I said at the beginning, too often in this debate at the moment about China and the United States and the challenge that the United States presents to uh, that China presents to the United States in Asia, American strengths are almost routinely under underplayed, and there is a tendency, as it has been for quite some time, I think, in the debate, to chart a, a, a very neat line between growing Chinese economic uh, hegemony with their ability to uh, exercise greater strategic muscle. Now that's not, of course, to turn a, a blind eye to what's been happening uh, in the South China Sea. But in terms of power projection and in terms of their experience in running a major conflict, uh, I think some of these questions are, are not dealt with sufficiently enough in the debate. What then, if I could just move to the conclusion, what then is required to deliver America from this period of drift? Previous shocks to the national psyche in the 20th century. Pearl Harbor, Sputnik, Japan's economic challenge in the 1980s, all in many ways acted as a catalyst for national unity in America. They brought the country together. But the crises today are a lot more subtle than multifaceted. multifaceted excuse me. They are paralyzing the political system rather than revitalizing it. The question I think worth bearing in mind here is what kinds of societies keep their balance amidst this type of turmoil? Because after all, despite the rancor and uh, the continued feuding between the White House and the Congress, between the courts and the media, the United States is steering a relatively steady course through this period of political turbulence. Trump will face undoubtedly a lot more spirited resistance. But absent a serious catalyst for impeachment, he will serve a full term and perhaps, should his base keep faith and the recent polls show that they are, he may well be re-elected. Equally, it hardly needs pointing out that a war or a major terrorist attack on American soil would turn much of the analysis I've given you on its head. Such an event would rouse once more the deep, exceptionalist impulse in America's view of itself and the world. But absent such a crisis, some in Washington and New York, and I was very struck by how gloomy they all were when I spoke with them late last year, some like Robert Kagan, for example, uh, the conservative commentator, said, quote, there will be more damage to America's standing in the world under Trump. If we are in this mood, he said, Trump or his successor may not be able to turn the ship around because the trough we're in might be too deep or too long. And it might be difficult to recover, Kagan said, unless there's a war. Uh, I also spoke with the editor of Foreign Affairs, Gideon Rose, who said, quote, Trump has complicated significantly the job of the next president in restoring and updating the liberal international order. He said that job will be harder because many abroad, especially American allies, will be wondering if the United States is even committed to it. So, finally, I think Trump's style, his erratic behaviour, his impulsiveness ensures that doubts about the United States will persist. And it's incumbent on close allies to think about American staying power differently. Not to pull the curtain down and to uh, kind of drift into panics or feverish alarm about abandonment, but just to think about what are the consequences for America's ability to have that transformational capacity abroad. An ally of the ears of allies will need to be more finely attuned to the anger and frustration pouring out of middle, middle America, along with the kinds of repercussions that has on Washington's self-confidence and capacity. Right now, the United States has a president who openly brandishes the country's fatigue with both mythological and military overstretch. Thanks, I'll leave it with that.